author of the best-selling book, Balsa Brasileira, which is a book on the rise and fall of the Brazilian economy, and of a forthcoming book on the political economy of COVID-19 in Brazil. Laura researches the relationship between economic growth and income distribu distribution and has served as a columnist for the Brazilian national newspaper Folha de Sao Paulo. Um, Laura received her PhD from the sister institution of um, the UMass Economics Department, which is the economics department of the New School for Social Research and is also a Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis Senior Fellow. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you, Laura. Laura will today share her analysis of how stark inequalities along racial, regional, and class lines account for why the pandemic has had such a devasta devastating impact on Brazil. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us, Laura. We will have 40 minutes um, of presentation, followed by about 40 minutes of Q&A. Um, and I should point out that this meeting is being recorded, as you have all heard, um, and that we also have started a YouTube channel for the UMass Political Economy Workshop, so um, the recording will be uploaded later on. This brings me to my last point, which is the Q&A. So you can use the chat box for the Q&A. You can also use the chat box now um, to discuss questions um, that you might have, but we will call on you during the Q&A in case you are more comfortable to not post your question via video, once we get to the Q&A, you can write it into the chat box. But um, generally speaking, you just need to put your name there so that we know that you would like to ask the question. Okay, without further ado, um, Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Isabella. Uh, th thanks a lot for, for inviting me. It's great to uh, not really to be around, uh, but to be around in a certain way uh, uh, at UMass again. Uh, of course, it is our sister institution. Um, as a new schooler, I've been there so many times and have so many good friends and colleagues. So it is great to be uh, in a way back, even though in this difficult situation. Uh, well, so basically um, what I'll try to show you in this 30 to 40 minutes uh, of the initial presentation. And I, I do think that uh, I, the discussion will be uh, really what's, what's most important here. And, and I welcome all of you to, to give comments and questions. Um, is really how uh, maybe Brazil is an example of um, a country that has everything uh, that the U.S. had in terms of uh, total failure dealing with uh, COVID-19, of course. Uh, so we were one of the global epicenters in terms of the number of that. Um, um, and of course, we, we were also one of the countries that managed pretty badly the, 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 the pandemic when it comes to the health um, sphere, right? Um, and we have many similarities to the U.S., uh, political uh, similarities, and of course, the way to, to, to handle it uh, by both presidents also finds a lot of um, similarities. And in a way, I think um, our president even copied uh, Donald Trump in the way uh, he dealt with, with, with this pandemic. So, of course, there is this side of the story, but then there's another side of the story uh, that is very relevant, uh, which is how structural inequalities and uh, income and racial inequalities have played the role. Of course, in the US, uh, this was very striking as well, uh, but here we're speaking of a country that has even sharper uh, inequalities and really starking differences, uh, both in, in, in terms of social vulnerability, access to health, and so, we can say that we are a more extreme case of how inequalities play a role uh, in a situation like this. And, and uh, the way uh, we have dealt with this uh, topic in the paper that we have published, uh, well, as a working paper still at the Levy Institute, so it's a public policy brief uh, co-authored with Luisa Nassif-Pires, who is uh, 
also a former New School uh, a PhD graduate who is now a, a researcher at the Levy Institute. She's here uh, and she can help also answer questions later on. Um, uh, and Eduardo Havet, who is a former PhD student of mine uh, in Sao Paulo, who is now a former master's student of mine in Sao Paulo, who is now a PhD student at American University in DC. Uh, is basically to look at the relationship between inequality and uh, the, the, the pandemic uh, in, in a way, uh, basically uh, as a twofold story. So of course, inequality as a risk factor uh, in how the pandemic uh, evolved, uh, but also uh, inequality as a consequence as being aggravated by the pandemic and, and in, in, in a way, I think this is how we've all been, been handling this, this subject so far. Um, the, the real issue here is that, of course, uh, inequality is both something that exacerbates the, the consequences, the effects of the virus, but it's also something that is aggravated by the virus, which means we're left after this situation uh, more, even more vulnerable to uh, a next shock, uh, and this can be another pandemic or other types of economic shocks, right? Or even non-economic shocks. Uh, so we, we try to, to, to pin down um, some of these, uh, some, some parts of this story in Brazil. And the first step was basically to try to build an index that would look at the same time at different factors linked to social vulnerability that could play a role in explaining the number of cases of infections, the pace of infection, but also uh, the number of, uh, of death in, in, in this pandemic. And, and so we have built an index. Uh, the index basically looks at labor market conditions. So whether, to be short, whether the person um, works at one of the services that were considered by the federal government as essential and so continued to be open uh, since the beginning of, of the crisis. Um, um, but also we look at how people get to work so that the mode of transportation um, using a national survey, household survey that has all this information. Uh, we also, uh, uh, computed in the index uh, whether living conditions, so whether the family has access to a sewage and clear water in clean water uh, system, because and there there is one aspect that maybe in the U.S. isn't as relevant in terms of uh, access to to in terms of inequality and in access to to infrastructure. But in Brazil, this is something that showed right at the beginning of the pandemic when people were saying, okay, wash your hands, and then people in the slums don't even have clean water to do so, right? Uh, and that happens even more if you go to, to the northeast of the country. Then we also added into the index uh, aspects uh, related to how many people sleep in the same bedroom, so the density in the housing, uh, in the households. Uh, and, and so all of these factors that we think help explain the rate of infection, the risk to being uh, one of the cases, uh, one of the COVID-19 cases, if we look at the data that we then generate in terms of, um, uh, based on the official statistics, which of course underestimates even more than in the US, the actual number of cases. Then the other side of the story was to look into uh, things that are not necessarily linked uh, to a higher risk of infection, but that are linked to a higher risk of having a severe uh, case of COVID-19. And so there enters uh, the healthcare system, of course, and inequality in the access to the healthcare system. And there, there are differences with the US. I mean, Brazil, Brazil does have a universal public uh, healthcare system. Um, it's one of the few developing countries actually that does so have uh, a, a universal free public health care that actually uh, has more than 100 uh, million people um, being uh, attended by it. Uh, but still, it's, um, it's, it, it, we do have a dual type of system in which the elites of the countries have access to the private healthcare system. And so 
uh, there are very big inequalities in terms of how many um, um, beds, hospital beds and emergency beds, etc., are available for different segments of the, the, the population. So there, a second part of the paper looks into whether um, how how unequally how unequally distributed is access to healthcare, uh, also in regional terms and racial terms, but we also look into a third issue that affects the the severity of cases, which is the presence of comorbidities, right? The the chronic diseases that are associated with uh, the the most severe cases, and and in particular with death coming from uh, the virus. So we, we, we look into how comorbidities, diabetes and other comorbidities that are linked to these severe cases are also very unequally distributed in the population. I'll, so I'll show you a few charts to, to end the discussion, but I decided not to be with the presentation the whole time as I think we're all trying to, to, to adapt to this Zoom uh, experience and are all exhausted by it. So. Uh, I'll show you some charts at the very end. Um, and then finally, uh, we, we have a second part of the story. And the second part of the story is, the, is linked to the following situation. Brazil, uh, if we look at the Latin American, and in fact, other Latin American countries also had a terrible experience during this pandemic. Um, but if we look at Latin America, Brazil has uh, one of the, actually the largest fiscal stimulus relative to GDP in the region. Um, together with Chile and Peru, who also had a substantial um, amount of public expenditures during the pandemic, right? And in particular, uh, so we have spent more than 7% than of GDP uh, so far, which is huge for developing countries, even comparable uh, with uh, other basically advanced economies. Uh, and if we look at some parts of this stimulus package, it's even, we have a, a, a more significant, for instance, cash relief program in terms of the size of our economy than the US with the unemployment insurance and, and, and the other uh, cash transfers that were made. So we did have a very big response in terms of a fiscal response to this crisis. And, and in a way that shows this, uh, that creates this um, interesting uh, case because uh, it is clear that even though we did have a very strong fiscal response, which is not necessarily an initiative from the executive, uh, from the federal government or the president, in many cases it was approved by Congress uh, as something really against even what the economic team um, wanted to do. Uh, um, but it, it was a very, very strong response. We, we got rid of all our fiscal rules temporarily and were able to, to issue public debt to finance these uh, expenditures. And, and, in, in, and, and in a way, it creates the situation in which countries such as Brazil, but it's also the case in Chile Peru, and Peru, who had more resources and more fiscal space in a way, or at least had the capacity to go into higher uh, indebtedness, to, to finance, to fund a, a, a strong response to this crisis, still saw the number of, of, that, uh, of death and cases um, um, really uh, uh, increase and grow in a dramatic way. And, 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 and other countries in the region that were less, had the less had less possibilities of facing this crisis in economic, in terms of the economic fiscal response, such as Argent Argentina or Uruguay, who spent way less in terms of their GDP, um, had a much better uh, performance in terms of controlling the spread of the virus. And in particular, Uruguay is a very significant case as a country in the region that really almost didn't do much in terms of fiscal of a fiscal response and, and had one of the lowest death tolls um, uh, in even the world. Uh, so why is it so? Well, basically, um, uh, of course, inequality may be one of the explanations. And, and, and Uruguay is, what, is also one of the last unequal countries in the region, uh, if we look at Gini indexes and so on. Uh, but this doesn't mean that um, 
the and also of course the anti the anti scientific approach from the press and other parts of the the story uh, play a role there. But this doesn't mean, though, that the fiscal response was useless in a way. And so we, we started in the second part of the paper to analyze how the fiscal response has prevented the crisis from uh, in the other direction of causality, how the crisis has affected inequality. There, it may not have prevented inequality from being a risk factor, but it did prevent inequality to increase as a consequence of the crisis, at least while the Auxilio Emergencial, which is this very big cash emergency cash relief program that was created uh, during the pandemic uh, and that touched more than 60 million people uh, in Brazil, uh, beneficiaries, uh, and also, well, uh, it was basically a substantial, amount, a substantial amount of cash transfer if we compare to people's previous income and so on. This was able, and we show in the paper how, how labor market inequalities have increased. So when you look at labor income, uh, we did see a 5% increase in the Gini index. But then if we look at the same time at how much people earned in terms of this cash transfer, and we have a survey that was done during the pandemic that allows us to do that. Um, if we add the auxilio emergencial, the per capita value of the auxilio emergencial, we see that inequality actually decreased during one of the most dramatic economic crises that we ever faced, which is very, um, um, strong as a result, of course, a temporary one, because this program will end. Uh, it already ended, I mean, it already it was cut by half in the, in, the, in the next four months, but then at the end of 2020, um, it, is, it is over. Uh, at this point, we don't have a new program to replace it. And so this, this inequality that uh, at, up to this point has been neutralized, and in fact, the bottom half of the distribution in Brazil uh, so we're talking about half of the population, did not see uh, a fall in income in average during the pandemic due to this cash transfer. Uh, this will end. And, and of course, uh, the other side of the, the, the story, namely uh, how the pandemic will uh, increase inequalities and leave us in a more vulnerable situation to face a new crisis eventually or a new shock, will show up uh, and will appear uh, if nothing else is put on, on, on uh, it's, it's, it replaces the, the, the current program. Um, and that's coming, and we show how this is coming and the magnitude of, of these effects um, in the paper. Uh, so basically, um, the fiscal response was able to neutralize the economic effects uh, and the, the, the effects on inequality of the crisis. It was able then to attenuate the recession in Brazil. Uh, the numbers, the projections, the GDP projections um, that were uh, basically around the fall of 9% of GDP at, up to, at some point are now back to a, a, a fall, a recession of 5, 5.2% of GDP for this year, and that's definitely connected, associated with the, the impact, the fiscal stimulus that has been done, and in particular, Auxilio Emergencial, which costed more than 4% of GDP, and, and, and basically um, uh, is even, uh, had, had an even higher multiplier given how, and now we're starting to see this, given how it, it concentrated in areas, there were poor areas in the country, Northeast, north of the country and, and these areas even saw an increase in tax receipts during the pandemic. Uh, local governments saw an increase in tax receipts due to the how, how the multiplier effect um, worked uh, coming from in, in these very low income uh, regions and areas uh, where really the, 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 the amount of money that was given had, was way more than the average income of, of families and household there. Uh, so, well, this is basically um, what, what I have. Of course, there are things that um, uh, we, we try to discuss that have to do with how uh, this connects with the uh, economic policy framework that, that had uh, been uh, in place in Brazil before the pandemic. Brazil is one of these countries in which 
um, austerity was quickly, quickly, very quickly uh, over uh, in, in this situation, even in a government that um, is uh, very, um, well, with an economic team that is very pro-market, uh, market fundamentalist even. Um, but very quickly, the pandemic has, has turned um, around the, the economic policy framework. Uh, the fiscal response was huge, as I said, and of course there, are, there is a paradox there because um, the, the, the project uh, of the, the Bolsonaro's government itself entered in a certain conflict and tensions, and some parts of the government are now seeing uh, a higher popularity, well, basically we have polls that show higher popularity of the government in poor sections of the population that were not at all supporting the government even in the elections uh, but that came with the cash relief program that the government did it itself decide to implement so of course this is creating uh, a, a scenario and a political scenario as well that is very challenging given that it is important to push forward uh, for a, a continuing program, uh, something that replaces it and something that can keep inequality from going up and prevent inequality from going up in the and poverty in the next few uh, months. Uh, but at, at, on the other hand, of course, the government is now uh, turning into, it's starting to, to, to understand that maybe an economic policy that goes towards uh, the poorest sections of the population is something that is politically interesting. And of course, that creates a lot of other risks to democracy, uh, uh, given that it's also a, a government with authoritarian um, uh, traits and, and, and intentions. Uh, uh, so, well, this is uh, something we can discuss more in the in the uh, Q and A session. Uh, I'll just show you now a couple of charts here uh, to to end the presentation that we can also discuss more. Uh, and Louisa, my co-author, is here and, and can help me uh, with this, maybe. But uh, can you see my... Yes, we can see your screen. Maybe if you can uh, put it into full screen. Yeah. Full screen, yes. Great. Can you see it now in full screen? Uh, I think it's about to load. Right now it's black. <laughs> um, no. Okay. Somehow it turned black, um, which is weird. Wait, let me let me try again. Now, try. now we can see it. Yes. Okay. Well, so as I said, uh, the paper, the working paper is really work in progress. Uh, we just started to look at some data uh, uh, and it's a Levy Economics Institute policy brief. Um, basically, what we have is that after building the index I spoke about, which tries to, to, to look at, to put together all these different dimensions uh, through which social vulnerability can affect the risk of infection, what we saw was the correlation between this index, which is basically putting together information in terms of housing conditions, living conditions, uh, labor market conditions, etc. And uh, we looked at the average index by Brazilian states. Uh, we have very strong regional inequalities in Brazil. So the north and the northeast of the countries are really where the poor population concentrated. Um, and we saw how this index, the average social vulnerability index, actually correlates quite strongly with the number of cases per uh, 100,000 100, of COVID-19 cases per 100,000 population. Um, we also saw a strong correlation uh, with the number of deaths, but less strong than with the number of cases, with, which kind of points towards what we mentioned, which is in order to, for the severity of the cases, it's not only social vulnerability that plays a role, it's also access to health, it's also comorbidities, and other things that are also affected uh, by inequality, but that we did not have the information in the same survey, and so we didn't include, we didn't include in the index. We analyzed it separately, as I'll show. Uh, it's also interesting how 
the correlation between our index and the number of cases um, has increased over time. So the, the third chart here is basically by date. We see uh, each, each point there is the correlation. So the, the Pearson correlation that, is not, that we can see for one particular date, for two particular dates in the previous two charts, uh, we have each of them as a point. And so we see how this correlation between the average index and, and the number of cases in, has increased up to a point in June in which it reaches a peak um, for the number of cases, uh, which shows how while the virus was spreading, um, it entered through elites, right, who were traveling abroad and who, who brought the virus and so on. But then as it spreads to the population, social vulnerability has increased its explanatory power in a way, and uh, up to a point, and, and, and we're, we still don't know why there is a peak and it starts falling. Um, uh, of course, one of the hypotheses could be some kind of herd immunity, but we don't want, of course, we don't know anything about it um, to, to, to point towards this. Of course, the poor people, as they died way more, maybe the, the rate of infection um, slowed down in, among the poor and so social vulnerability didn't play as much as a role in the past couple of months as it did in the peak of the, of the pandemic. But obviously this is very, uh, it's a very long shot to, to go to from what we have so far as evidence, uh, but it's something that has puzzled us and would like to look uh, more into it. Uh, we also look into uh, different groups, so how the social vulnerability index that we show how, uh, how much of a power it has in explaining uh, the behavior of the, the infection rates and so on, how it, 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 it changes uh, if we look uh, um, among different genders and also uh, by selected ratio groups. So we show how non-whites have a higher social vulnerability when it comes to that index, even when they are at the top of the distribution. So race matters even uh, at the top of the distribution. Of course, the difference decreases as you move along uh, from the bottom to the top of the income distribution, but still social vulnerability is higher for, for non-whites, which includes brown and indigenous people. And brown in Brazil doesn't mean exactly uh, brown in, in the US, uh, it's what we call pardo, which is really uh, people who have an African, uh, who are, uh, have an African descendancy, but who uh, do not consider themselves black when they, when they answer a survey, which also reflects um, historical racism, how people define themselves, right? Uh, but in any case, uh, we see how uh, this is really, um, there is a big uh, racial element into this uh, social vulnerability, which helps explain why, in fact, the number of cases and death has been dramatically uh, affecting non-white populations. Uh, we also looked, as I said, into the comorbidities, and this is another part of the paper that I mentioned, how uh, really uh, the presence of these diseases, uh, chronic diseases, uh, increases when you go to people who have lower degree of education, which is the data we have for this in a national health survey. Uh, uh, and we compare that into, with the data that we actually have from COVID-19 infections, symptoms, and uh, hospitalizations in Brazil. And we see that really, uh, and this is data from a new survey uh, that was done during the pandemic, uh, we do see that uh, there is a very uh, big difference when we go, especially when we go to hospitalizations and, 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 and people who are put on a ventilator, uh, we see, because here, uh, just to explain the chart, obviously when we talk about the bottom 50%, if everything was equal, the 50% of the population would also have be the 50% of the population with, say, three symptoms of COVID-19 or hospitalized. So the same share of the population will show in the x-axis and the y-axis, right? So whenever you see a difference, meaning that, for instance, in the top 10%, of the income distribution. Uh, you see that it's almost 10% of the people with three plus symptoms of COVID-19 who answered the survey, but it's only, it's less than, um, it's less than 0.2% uh, of 
uh, the people who are put on a ventilator. Uh, and that's even dr more dramatic when we consider that to even be put on a ventilator is something that is only the privilege of those who have access to healthcare. So we see that really the severity of cases is really affected by income inequality and not only the contagion, right? Which is something that we pointed towards uh, at, at the beginning of the paper. And here it's uh, already the, the end of the story here. It's also it's the impact on inequality, as I mentioned in the, in the presentation, uh, when we look at per capita labor income before and after COVID-19 per income percentile, per group, per income group, uh, you see that, uh, so the blue line is the pre-crisis income levels. The, the yellow is the post-crisis, the, the, the June income level, which is when the survey was carried out. And the green line is the June income level plus the cash relief, the emergency cash relief that was transferred in per capita terms. And really here you see how for the bottom 50%, really for the bottom 10 and 20 or the bottom 30 of the population, when you add auxiliary emergencial, people are left with a higher income than they had before the crisis, right? Uh, when we reached half the 50%, the median, household, it's more or less the same. So Auxilio Emergencial is really able to um, fully compensate the falling income that the crisis has generated. And finally, as you move, of course, towards the top, uh, then the falling income is, is, is higher than the, than the transfer of the Auxilio Emergencial. The program was designed as a way as to uh, benefit informal workers, uh, unemployed workers, as well as poor families who already touched previous social programs. So, uh, of course, it doesn't, it's not given uh, to, uh, really, it's not targeting the rich, but it does, uh, it did touch, it did help um, uh, also um, in, in some of the, the middle, from the middle to the top of the distribution, but of course there it wasn't enough. Uh, and so that's why inequality actually fell in Brazil uh, during the crisis, right? The rich had a larger fall in income in, in average than, than the bottom half of the, of the distribution. Uh, so, well, this is what I have here. Uh, I'll stop sharing the screen and, and answer your questions. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Laura. I think this was really a great, both big picture introduction and uh, very fine grained, careful empirical work. Very impressive. Thank you so much. I think this really gives us a good overview of what's going on in Brazil, as well as food for thought of angles that we could take on other country case studies. Um, so let's open the discussion with the Q&A. If you would like to ask a question, or give a brief short comment, <laughs> no second talks please. Um, you can uh, post your name in the chat box or simply write stack um, and I will then call upon you. So if you have a question, please write stack into the chat box with everyone. Um, why we are waiting, I actually have a question. Um, so I've been wondering, um, you focus on cash transfers in terms of income inequality, right? And in, at least in some countries, um, access to food and access to, I mean, basic necessities of daily life became a problem in the pandemic as the supply chains um, became vulnerable, right? So I'm wondering to what extent this increase in cash income actually translated into an actual increase in real consumption in terms of availability to, um, to needed uh, goods and services? Okay, um, well, it did. Uh, so Brazil did have uh, an increase in food prices during the, the pandemic. Uh, well, it really followed international markets on that. Uh, on that. Uh, and also because periphery countries faced a very big, strong uh, currency devaluation, during uh, the pandemic, that did translate into uh, higher food prices. Um, uh, here, I mean, the structure, there are many uh, really food productions that are linked to inputs that come from abroad. And also the fact that we have a big export, um, uh, we have a very big export, 
really a, a sector that is focused on exporting uh, food uh, to China and to, to other countries around the world, world makes uh, these producers actually very sensible to exchange rate fluctuations. And when food prices go up and the exchange rate gets devalued, uh, basically they pass through higher prices as well in, in the internal domestic markets. And so uh, it is true that this has harmed the, the real uh, effects, let's say the real gains that poor people had in terms of uh, the, the cash transfer. But we did not have shortages um, in the food supply chain. Uh, and, and really, if you look at poverty levels, uh, I mean, they did decrease substantially to even the lowest record of poverty that were all ever um, appearing in Brazilian data in, in the series that we had. So it, it's quite, uh, it's really big how, how this auxiliary measuring cell really had a big effect. And I see that there are questions about the design of the auxiliary that I, I would like to answer to show why it is so. Uh, so yes, we did have a boost in consumption. I mean, of course we had a fall in, in aggregate consumption uh, during the pandemic, but there, are, there is evidence that, and I think we have to look at this into this further, uh, but we do have evidence that um, um, the, the consumption, uh, basically the, the cash relief program uh, attenuated um, substantially the fall in consumption that we would observe otherwise. Thank you. Uh, let's move to Michael Ash, who has a question on that program. Michael, would you like to ask a question? Oh, sure. Yeah. So I, I had put it in the um, chat, but uh, th thank you. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. Thanks so much for it. Just, um, and I'm looking at the working paper, but can you describe the Auxilio Emergencial in more detail? Um, what were the requirements and exclusions? Sort of how, how large was it in terms of making, making households uh, whole? I guess we got some sense of that from, from, from your, um, yeah. your bar graph. Thanks. Okay, so basically Brazil already had uh, one of the largest cash transfer programs uh, in the planet, maybe the largest before the pandemic. It's called Bolsa Familia. It's, a, it's a quite a large uh, cash transfer program, which is a conditional cash transfer program, uh, which of course depends on how, what, what, what people's income are. And, and then it also has uh, requirements. So families, uh, households in order to touch the benefits um, had to put their kids into school and prove that they're attending school and other things that uh, aim at more long run uh, effects, right? Uh, so the first uh, universe of beneficiaries of the cash relief, the emergency cash relief program that was created were exactly the, the, the recipients that already touched both the families. So all of those, uh, which means around 12 to 13 uh, million families uh, were included and were automatically receiving the benefit, the new benefits. And the new benefit was around three times more in terms of value than the previous program. So that's a first part of the story, right? So, and this was very quick because these people were already registered. They had their the method uh, in order to transfer was the same. And, and so this was, the, the easy part. Then the tough part was to add informal workers and, and, uh, and families who entered into poverty, but who were not previous recipients of uh, Bolsa Familia. Uh, there, um, one useful uh, uh, thing is that the, the, the federal government did have, due to um, previous social policies that had been carried out, uh, a big record um, uh, of families that touched other social programs in the past and so on. And this was used um, as a way to accelerate uh, the, 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 let's say the new, the new payments. Um, but then from that, um, from that record, from that, the people who were registered there, those who had, who were entitled were basically those who um, did not, so did not have any, or informal workers um, who were not 
currently touching unemployment benefits or retirement pensions, other types of social benefits. Um, and, and, and there was the, the, the benefit was per adult, but if you were in a household and you were the chief, let's say the, the only provider for kids in your household, then you could touch the, the two benefits. Uh, 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 and so you had the double amount. Um, basically people had to fill out a form and those who were not in that record, there was a download, the, the government created a new app that people had to download in their mobile phones and they would fill out a form and in this form they would ask whether, you, so you did not have another source of income, so you are an informal worker, you, are, you don't have, uh, uh, you're not touching more than X and so there was a a limit, of course, a ceiling, uh, and, and based on previous income tax um, uh, data from the previous year, and, there, there, and then you, you were analyzed, your data was checked, uh, and you got the benefits later on. There was a problem implementing for those, because of course you had to download the app, um, people had trouble understanding how to fill out the app, and then the bank that was making the payments, which is a Brazilian public commercial bank, was crowded with lines and people were exposing themselves to the virus in order to touch the benefit, which was a tragedy at the beginning. But then later on, uh, this was sorted out. So it was quite big. I mean, 50, more than 50 million, almost 60 million uh, people were benefited by the program. And the, the amount was around uh, $150 per month uh, since the beginning of the pandemic per adult, but really 150 US dollars is quite a big amount for most uh, Brazilian families. Uh, I mean, it's really, as I showed, able to more than compensate the falling income that people had during the pandemic. So I think that speaks by for itself in terms of, um, it's really half of the, more than half of the minimum wage um, and people in Brazil, half of the labor force does not touch the minimum wage because they are informal workers. So it's it's quite it's quite a big um, it's quite a big transfer, and it's also quite a big program because in the end, I mean, in the first three months, it was already two percent of GDP, and then it was extended several times. Uh, it's now cut by half for the past, the next couple of months, but even so, it's gonna reach 6% of GDP, um, which is huge, really, uh, in terms of a social program in Brazil. The Bolsa Família, for you to have an idea, is 0.5% of GDP per year. So it's really, in the first three months, this program costed four times what the Bolsa Família program uh, costs in a year. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I have Jayati next. Jayati, would you like to ask your Yeah, question? thank you. Thank you, Laura. That was absolutely fascinating and uh, really interesting work. Uh, I'm actually very interested in the political economy of this emergency social benefit. Because, you know, in India, we got exactly the opposite. We got a government that didn't give anything actually reduced. And, and of course, there's a significant increase in poverty and all the expected things. But you have an equally right-wing neoliberal regime in Brazil that for some reason responds. Yeah. What was going on? And also then why are they stopping it now? What, in other words, what's the political economy of this whole thing? It, yeah. It's quite amazing, yeah? It is, yeah, it is. Uh, so basically, uh, it, it was quite surprising how a consensus was built Right at the beginning, right at the start, um, the, some social movements organized uh, in, in basically a request. So there's really a lot of different social movements in civil society that organized to request a, a, a generous social transfer program right at the beginning when the government, when local governments started to ask to, to implement lockdown uh, measures which were soft in Brazil as compared, for instance, to, to India, as far as I, as I understand. But still, it, they were soft and there was this big concern about, okay, so you're making people stay at home. We have 50% of the labor force in the informal market. People will not touch any kind of benefit. And so people who won't stay at home and they will expose to the virus. And really, very quickly, there was this big 
um, movement in, in civil society to, to ask for uh, a minimum income or some kind of transfer. And, and Congress, uh, at that point, really, the, the crazy thing about the, the, the Bolsonaro's government is that it has a very, very uh, uh, neoliberal economic team, but at the same time, um, it, it doesn't do much in a way because it has this approach uh, to, to, to government, which means, which, which is more about really mobilizing its own base and having uh, and internal enemies and so on uh, that we all know very well, uh, instead of actually pushing uh, for an economic agenda. So for instance, it did a pension reform, but really the people who led the, the reform that was approved in the end was the president of, of, the, the, of Congress and not the economic team. And so Congress was already pushing different types of economic agendas since the beginning. It sort of took over the lead in terms of uh, the economic policy agenda in many areas, uh, including a tax reform that is now under debate. And the government is really having a very auxiliary role there. And what happened is that Rodrigo Maia, the president of the, of, of, of the House of Representatives started to um, be op basically opened the door for, for these pr uh, pressures uh, and, and in a way very quickly approved something that was much larger in amount than what the government was proposing. At some point at the very beginning, the economic team did design and tried to, to, to make its own proposal. The proposal was basically 200 reals instead of the 600 that have been approved. So three times less, and also for a much smaller universe of beneficiaries. So it, it, the cost of the program that the government had proposed uh, was uh, basically 10 times less than the, the cost of the program that in the first three months, but then this was extended several times. Uh, so really, we're talking about a completely different program. What, what the economic team wanted to do is nothing comparable to what Congress ended up approving. And of course, it approved with the support of the left, of the opposition in Congress. Uh, and now that's why I mentioned that we are in some kind of a, a difficult scenario, because then the program was so big that uh, people understood how actually destinating uh, sizable part of the budget to um, poor people is able to, to really reduce inequality levels very quickly and poverty levels very quickly. And this really makes a very strong impact and in concrete terms to these families who during the pandemic, in spite of the number of deaths and how unequal this was in terms of racial and income inequalities, uh, uh, still, uh, Bolsonaro has gained popularity uh, in the bottom of the distribution during the pandemic, as opposed to Donald Trump, as opposed to other presidents who had such a bad handling of the situation, right? So the, the auxilio then started to have an appeal, a political appeal to the government itself, who then started to uh, uh, of course, uh, praise the, the, the program and ended up creating a new one, announcing that they would create Renda Brasil, which would potentially be a replacement for previous Bolsa Família, so for the previous cash. So they would stop using the name that, of course, the Workers' Party had used for its own program, create a new program with a new name, uh, and that new name and the program would be larger, both in terms of the amounts that is transferred, but also in terms of the number of people and families, but of course still much less than what the current uh, emergency program is. But then still they weren't able to do it. And what's really interesting is that because the economic team does not want from next year on to change the current fiscal rules and Brazil has a spending ceiling that is very, very strict um, but basically froze public spending for the, the next decade. Uh, uh, and it's currently unsustainable, everyone knows it, but still the economic team does not want to give up on that spending ceiling. And they had to send a budget for next year that does not leave any room for an expansion of the current social uh, cash transfer program. And they are trying 
different ways to then remove from another area, from another program to give to this program. But then when the president himself started to realize that this is really uh, a risky political choice because then they may take out from say a program that uh, benefits another parts of the population to give to this. And, and so this is really creating a, a very challenging uh, situation to interpret and including uh, the left and the opposition now is very concerned about what kind of program they want to support, of course, right? Because in a way, if it's really a small program that doesn't change much in terms of previous Bolsa Familia, uh, but changes the name and gives somehow the government credit, uh, uh, it really, of course, uh, creates other types of democratic risks. And, and so this is where we are now. Uh, Bolsonaro may want to do something. There is a fight between the military sections of the government who want a new economic policy agenda and want to shift the agenda towards um, something more, I won't, I won't say progressive because it really goes far away from it, but say it's a more fiscally, at least a more fiscally loose type of policy. Uh, and then the economic team, uh, which is Chicago, uh, uh, Chicago, uh, like a minister who is wanting to, to, to really privatize and, and stick to the previous agenda. Thank, Thank you. you, that's fascinating. Yeah. Thank um, you. Francisco Perez had a question that is quite directly related to this and is also the next in the list. Francisco? Yes, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, similarly, I had a question about the politics of the um, cash transfers and what this has done for, for Bolsonaro's popularity and how this clashes with his team's original plan to cut public spending dr drastically. Um, you know, which is, um, are they gonna cut public spending? Are they, are they talking about that? Or are they um, really trying to uh, hold on to the, to the popularity created by these new programs? Yeah, uh, so, well, basically, as I mentioned, uh, the, the program apparently, and of course it's not the only reason, we don't know exactly how much of the gain uh, in popularity that Bolsonaro had can be directly linked to the cash relief program. There may be other areas. Uh, even the, the approach to the pandemic itself may have had an appeal given that he at the beginning, since the beginning, did not want um, to, to take the, 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 the lockdown measures uh, seriously and, and entered in a, into a conflict with local governments, such as in the same way as in the US. Um, um, of course, informal workers and people who are less able to, to work from home, etc., already have a less of a, may have a, a less of a, um, may connect to, to his uh, approach in a, in a way, right? But in, in any case, what we do see uh, is an increase in support for Bolsonaro in the at the bottom of the distribution and um, uh, a decrease in support for Bolsonaro at the top of the distribution, who is basically its core um, uh, in terms of its core support in the 2018 elections. Uh, so it's the support for him in in the uh, in the section of the population that had the largest proportion of voters who approved the government fell dramatically, and then it increased in a section where he did not have a strong support, and that can also be observed when we look regionally into the states in Brazil. So states in the north and northeast were those who actually elected Haddad, the, the opposition candidate in the previous election. And there, it's where Bolsonaro has gained support during the pandemic, um, which, again, uh, strengthens the, the, the possible rule of the cash relief program. And then uh, the government will, uh, so far, so, so far, uh, what's going on is that every week, there is a new announcement of um, um, how the government would fund a new cash relief a new cash transfer program. So the, the, the cash transfer, it even changed the names already for the second time. So it was Renda Brasil, then Bolsonaro said, I don't want to do it anymore. And now it's Renda Cidadã, it's the new one. But then 
since the, the, in the past couple of months, what's going on is the government sent a budget. The budget does not leave any room for an increase in public spending. And in fact, uh, we're going to reduce, yes, public spending um, next year, given, especially given what we had this year. But we're even reducing it in some areas relative to what's pre predicted before the pandemic even started. Uh, health, for instance, it's an area that had less um, uh, of a budget in real terms next year than we had even before the pandemic started. So it's going to be a big austerity um, uh, pro I mean, we're, it's a return to austerity that is um, now uh, in line for next year. But still, every week there is uh, this new idea. So, okay, let's take from, um, uh, let's freeze the minimum wage, which in Brazil affects, it's a floor for several other social benefits, and that will leave us uh, the room we need to give the, to, 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 to increase the cash transfer program. Uh, then Bolsonaro says, no, I don't want to do that because this is taking people from the middle of the distribution to give it to the bottom and this is not a good thing, etc. Of course, politically, it's also not such a smart move. But then the economic team comes with a new idea. And so it's basically Bolsonaro against the, the economic team and, and the military section of the government against the economic team. And everything that the economic team wants to do involves uh, political costs. And so it's unclear whether it's worth it um, for, for the government to do it, but it really does want to do it. And at the same time, it doesn't want to actually be seen as um, having as fiscally responsible, as changing the fiscal rule, as, and it, it did not want to say change the economic team. So the conflict is now uh, there and, and, and they tried also some maneuvers so the idea of taking from some funds that are not subject to the fiscal rules, so education funds that are going around the current spending ceiling could be used for this, and then they tried to suggest it, but then of course the markets hate this type of uh, um, creative accounting ideas, and, and this is how uh, it is so far. Uh, I think that the pandemic has really shown a, a weak, a structural weakness of, the, of Bolsonaro's project if we compare it even to the other far right, uh, new far right, recent far right movements around the world. The fact that it has this strong um, combination between say uh, authoritarianism and, and, and um, conservatism in many ways and a very market fundamentalist economic agenda obviously um, creates a clash um, that really clashes with the populist idea itself, right? So you do have this anti-systemic type of discourse, but then when it comes to the economic agenda, you don't deliver anything and you, you have this very status quo uh, continuity even with the previous agenda that had been implemented in the country since 2015. So, I think that that contradiction was there even in the electoral plan and Bolsonaro is not particularly someone who cares about the economic agenda. He's someone who's adapting and this may, and it, it's really work in progress what this project is about in the economic sphere. And it could be a project that really changes the economic agenda into something uh, less um, orthodox and, and that ends up in a way uh, becoming even uh, riskier in terms of uh, gaining uh, popular support for an authoritarian project. Thank you. Um, I have Alvaro Lima next on the list. Would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, my question is very simple. Uh, uh, I'm Brazilian, but I live in the US. I'm also uh, alumni from the New School. And uh, I, I, I saw your uh, interview with uh, uh, Governor Flavio Dino. And my question is how much the governors, particularly the, the Northeast governors, uh, are playing uh, on this crisis here in the US. Uh, Donald Trump mainly uh, throw at the governors the, the virus crisis and the economic crisis and says yours, you'll, you'll take care. And in Brazil, it looks like that, that the experience of the Northeast governors was a very interesting one. 
Yes, yeah, so of course, governors um, ended up uh, appearing a lot uh, at the beginning of the of the pandemic, given that they were the ones, say, uh, carrying out the uh, following the the, the 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 World Health Organization recommendations, right? And 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 in a way, governors, even in the right wing who uh, helped elect Bolsonaro, such as the governor of Sao Paulo, João Doria, the largest Brazilian state, um, were trying to uh, take advantage of the pandemic uh, to basically gain popularity as the ones who would implement the proper uh, health measures and who would do the lockdown measures and so clashed very quickly with the government on that. And, and uh, it's even more so for, it's, it's, it's even more true for governors in the left spectrum, such as Flavio Dino, uh, as you said. Uh, the problem is that uh, the, the speech of Bo the Bolsonaro's, the president's speech against lockdown measures uh, did have an appeal. And with, of course, the economic, so, the, the president uh, basically put himself in the position of the one who wanted to save the economy as such as Donald Trump did in a way and other state governors in the US. And he was the one concerned about the actual problems that people were facing, economic problems. And he was also the ones who were transferring cash reliefs. Uh, and so he positioned himself quite well and looking back uh, it's quite clear that the governments could not even sustain their position. And after a while, pressure and lobby from economic, different economic sectors was so dramatic that they ended up uh, not implementing strong lockdown measures. And so we, we stayed in the middle. Uh, we didn't do, we did, we did very loose, uh, lockdown measures, and this was the case in Sao Paulo, the governor, João Doria, ended up opening bars and restaurants at the peak of the, of the pandemic. I mean, there's no, in the end, there was no rationality whatsoever for the decision to reopen. And that's, of course, pressure coming uh, from, from all these um, business owners and, and that are uh, influenced by the discourse of the president. And so, in a way, I think they are the losers in this um, story. Bolsonaro is the winner, uh, clearly, uh, which is absurd when we look at the number of deaths. Uh, we, are, we now reached 150,000 dead people in Brazil last week, right? This weekend. I mean, when we look at that number, it's, 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 it's absolutely crazy how Bolsonaro, uh, who minimized the pandemic since the beginning is the big winner in the political uh, sphere, but it is, it seems to be the case. And, and I think there was a moment at the beginning that we thought that governors would be uh, the winners there. Uh, it's unclear that they did. Of course, it depends on the section of the population and so on. In some elites, I think Bolsonaro has lost ground, as I said, but um, I'm not sure the governors managed to do what they planned to do and, and the results were disastrous. Plus the cash relief program is a federal program and even if it helps people in a region, it cannot be attributed to the governors. Thank you, Laura. I have uh, Julius Duran, Pedro Sampaio, Laila, Peter Scott, and Roland Montenegro um, in the list. Sorry for my pronunciation. <laughs> um, if you would like to ask a question, please post stack in the chat box. We have about 25 more minutes, so there is time for more questions. Um, Julius Duran, would you like to go back next? Just in short, uh, thank you for, so much for the presentation. I live in Chile and here the middle, what is called the middle class, <laughs> and has suffered also in, the, in this crisis. In particular, they, they have used a lot of death, uh, private death. And I wonder if the same happened in Brazil, in order to see all these families who couldn't access to these cash transfers. Thank you. Yes, I mean, we're still waiting for more data on, on this. Um, but it's it clearly uh, household debt has increased um, during the pandemic in some parts, some sections, some income groups. Uh, 
and as, as in Brazil, financial inclusion is still not, uh, of course, as, as large as in the US. And so if you look at the bottom of the distribution, you don't see much of household debt, right? So you really have to look into the middle to, to see uh, uh, this effect. But apparently uh, there was an increase in that and this will probably slow down uh, the economic recovery. Uh, there's also a problem in terms of uh, how the, the government has created, and I haven't mentioned that, I think that's important in terms of projecting anything for uh, the next year. Um, the government was terrible and it was really catastrophic in the response uh, in terms of loans to small business and then other types of uh, attempts to, to help small business owners. And, and I think in a way, this is what opposes a bit what happened in the US and, and in Brazil. The, the government, I mean, the response was much stronger uh, in terms of cash transfers to the poor and much weaker in terms of uh, credit lines and so on. I'm, I'm not saying that there wasn't many problems in, in, in how the stimulus package in the US was done um, for uh, business. But still, uh, there was a, an attempt to, 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 to do so. And in Brazil, really, you had more than 800,000 uh, small companies that shut down that permanently their doors uh, before June already. And if you look at them, it's really companies with less than 49 um, employees. And so they couldn't access any credit lines whatsoever. Uh, the credit lines that were created were, were required very strong, um, uh, it was attached to the payroll and, and so it didn't help pay the rent and other, other parts. And so really it was a disaster there. And this is really, was, uh, in terms of the political economy of it, it's another aspect that we have to look at because business owners were part of the core supporters of the Bolsonaro's government since the beginning. And, and somehow the disaster in that area did not show in aggregate terms, in terms of uh, the numbers uh, in, in the polls and, and, and approval ratings and so on. Somehow the business owners uh, uh, blame on, on really blame on the, the, the lockdown measures. They don't blame on the lack of policies aimed at and, and credit lines and so on created to, 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 to make them go through the, 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 this period. So it's also a problem of how the left wasn't able to communicate that at all. Thank you, Laura. Um, I have Pedro Sampaio next. Pedro, are you there? Yes, yes, I am. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Laura, for your presentation here today. Uh, I was asking about a, a struggle within the, the Bolsonaro's government. Uh, there are people in the government who want to hold on to the austerity agenda Brazil has been following since 2015, while other people, most likely the military members of the government, are demanding higher government spending and new projects uh, regarding social transfers. So I was asking uh, which side does Laura think, think will most likely win this internal dispute within Bolsonaro's government? Well, Pedro, that's the big question, right? Um, um, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. I do think that uh, it will continue to pursue an austerity agenda. Um, uh, it will try in a way to do both, meaning that it will try to continue um, uh, showing, and, and this is a new thing, right? Uh, appearing as someone who is interested in creating a social, social policies and benefiting the poor, which is something that was completely absent, even in the discourse, in the, in the, in the agenda, it was never there. So it, was, it, it is clearly now reshaping uh, its, its discourse and it wants to have this, this appeal to um, uh, the population in the poor population and population in the northeast of the country, but I, I do not see how they will manage to to really implement something substantial because the austerity agenda I think is a very big compromise also between this government and the, the country's financial elites, and I, I would say that 
uh, they may do both in a way. So at, at most, what they would do is basically to implement some uh, structural reforms, very uh, liberal agendas, neoliberal agendas that they, they had planned in the past, uh, and at the same time that reduce the size of the states, that reduce public services um, and resources in several areas, and at the same time release some funds for a social cash transfer program. And that would not be a contradiction at all. I mean, uh, in fact, the, the, the economic minister, Paulo Guedes, uh, since the beginning, uh, used to defend Friedman's idea of an, a negative income tax. Uh, he said it in several, several campaign uh, events and interviews, even before uh, they were elected. And, and, and basically that idea, if we look back into Friedman's um, negative income tax idea, is basically uh, perfectly compatible with the idea that governments are inefficient and should not play with anything else in terms of basically you could give people uh, an income transfer, people who are be, be above, be, below a certain income threshold uh, on the one hand, um, and on the other hand, um, uh, have the government not intervene much in terms of setting minimum wages, uh, in terms of providing uh, public health care and education. And so that's really something that is compatible with uh, uh, at least the economic minister's idea of what uh, 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 the state should do in a way it can keep the stick to the austerity agenda and at the same time expand social cash transfers while it reduces resources for several other other areas uh, and reduces the idea of an, a, a welfare state in Brazil. Thank you, Laura. I have Laila next on the list. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, first of all, Laura, I'm a huge fan of yours. Um, so thank you very much for this opportunity, and Isabella. So uh, my question is more about the universal income uh, debate, because the left wing here in Brazil has uh, started this debate, this proposal. So I'm really curious to understand more about this, because uh, the cash transfer from the 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 auxilio emergencial has really bought me this uh, curiosity about is it possible to have an universal income uh, in a maybe a next government that is not under bolsonaro because i I understand this is very impossible on this uh, this government, but is this like uh, a possibility? Uh, this um, emergency net give us a hint about this. Uh, can we like uh, make our democracy stronger under a universal income? So um, I guess this is a far, uh, a really far away uh, thought, but it can be very interesting to start to talk about this now. Yeah, so indeed, um, maybe, um explaining first to the people who are not familiar with what's going on in the in the debate in Brazil. Uh, uh, it is true that from the auxilio emergencial, from this idea and the implementation and the results, uh, there, there is a very strong, um, um, the idea of a universal basic income, which was not something, I mean, of course you had some prominent uh, supporters of that idea in the in the past, but this this has turned into a central agenda in in, in the left, let's say, spectrum. After during the pandemic, out of a sudden, everyone was talking about it, and it is a very dangerous uh, debate. I would I would argue because um, you, as I mentioned in the previous answer. Um, you do have different ways to support such an agenda. And uh, one thing is to support a universal basic income and facing um, transformations in the labor market and with the idea of maybe strengthening the bargaining power of workers who are not uh, currently uh, formal or who are, have, who are engaged in precarious work relationships and, and it's, uh, to, to basically value socially productive activities that are not, that are undervalued. Of course, there is a very progressive way to um, argue uh, for 
such an agenda. And I think that part of what's going on in Brazil and how the Auxilio Emergencial has played the role, even though it was not universal, obviously, but it was a big program, um, and how it was able to reduce inequality and to reduce poverty makes it a strong case for income transfers as uh, a mean, as a, as a fiscal uh, decision that basically as, as, as increasing and enhancing the inequality reducing power of fiscal policy in, in a country like Brazil. Uh, obviously the left then uh, takes that agenda but also adds into that agenda um, a tax reform and so the idea is to fund uh, not necessarily a, a universal system immediately but something larger closer to what we had now as an emergency cash relief than what, what we had before in the previous Bolsa Familia program and gradually increase and expand on it and maybe fund it through taxation, income taxation at the top, which is very low in Brazil. We have a very, very big concentration of income at the top. So it's very, really justifiable and I, and I tend to, to, to support these types of proposals. But why do I say it's dangerous? Because at the same time, you do have um, a very strong support for universal labor basic income, actually not even universal, but, but cash transfer is very focused, targeted in the poor, uh, as opposed to a welfare state uh, in many ways. And so this is there in the debate in Brazil. And it's very hard sometimes for people to distinguish what kind of proposal um, is coming from where and why is it so that there is a big there seems to be a big consensus around this idea but then when we look a little dig a little deeper um, you have a lot of people in the debate who are in favor of reducing uh, the size of the state in many areas uh, who are in favor of the spending ceiling that basically reduces per capita spending in education and health um, and, and in other uh, parts of the, the, the network or even contributory, contributory uh, pension systems that have been reformed, et cetera, but are uh, supporting uh, benefits for the very poor and are in favor of that, right? And so this is uh, where we stand now. Uh, and, and also in general, people are talking about universal basic income to speak about targeted social programs and, and no one really understands the difference anymore. It's really a mess, uh, the, 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 the debate on, on this right now. But there is an initiative in Congress. I'm, I'm actually the advi one of the members of the advisory committee for this um, um, uh, basically organized, um, a collective of, of uh, people in Congress who want to think about a uh, different type of social program. And there's, there are people in the left and the right in the spectrum of this reunion of, of, of senators and, and congressmen who are thinking about this in very different ways and for very different purposes. And, and it's very dangerous because no one is actually, um, the government may use all of this to do something um, that is not at all what people have in mind uh, when we when we think about what what really we need in terms of inequality reduction. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, this is the reason why even Milton Friedman in places was in favor of a universal basic income, right? <laughs> the case. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to Peter Scott. Peter, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Uh, thanks, Laura. Um, very interesting. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I guess I would like you to um, to turn a little bit towards what do you think uh, is a sensible progressive alternative? I mean, you talked about how there are contradictions within the the sort of Bolsonaro um, camp, you talked about how Bolsonaro may have stolen the fire of some left-wing programs and, and the dangers that might sort of pose for, for democracy. And, but but what, what do you see as, as the, the alternative? And, and that has both the sort of short-run political dimension, but also a more sort of long-run economic policy dimension where I guess I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you, if you see any dangers in, in, in populist programs, whether left or right, uh, and, and, and what implications that might have. Okay, uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, good seeing you. 
I think that basically um, th there are a few, a few questions and a few different paths that I see that are possible now. I mean, uh, there is a, in terms of a long run agenda, right? I mean, in, I think uh, it's, I don't think the agenda, progressive agenda would look very different in Brazil than um, what they look right now uh, in the debates in the left around the world. So I don't see a, a very uh, different uh, ideas that could uh, work in, the, in our scenario and that could not and that are not under discussion already in other scenarios. So at the moment, for instance, I'm working on a, on a, on a grant um, on post COVID economic recovery plans. And really in terms of the economic agenda, I mean, what we're doing is to, at the same time, understand how to increase the redistributive power of uh, fiscal policy, both uh, in the taxation side and in the spending side, of course. At the same time, we are looking into green uh, recovery plans around the world and seeing what does apply in Brazil and what does not. And obviously there are differences and, and there are, and even in terms of, I mean, what, what we have in terms of singularities is that really our tax system is very regressive and very far away from uh, uh, a fair uh, system and we do have a lot of room because of that to tax the top we our maximum tax uh, uh, um, rate is basically uh, in the income in the official income taxation system is 27.5 percent at the top but that is not uh, what anyone pays at, at the top because basically capital income in Brazil is 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 not even taxed. There is an exemption um, for uh, dividends and, and profits that are distributed to, to, to people when it comes to personal income taxation. And so that makes it the effective tax rates at the top ridiculously low. So in terms of an agenda, just, this is just to say that in terms of a progressive agenda, I mean, we do have ideas and we do have clear um, uh, problems in the current system that I think actually the debate in areas that I think the debate has made progress in the past couple of years. There is a better sense already in society, for instance, about how uh, regressive the taxation system is. Still, um, I do not, when we go to the political, so your question has this political side of it, uh, which is okay. So what one thing is having an economic agenda. Obviously, the way we deal with public debt is different um, in periphery countries than in, in advanced economies. Uh, Brazil is in a, say, intermediate case there because we do not have foreign debt. We do, we do have, I mean, foreign sovereign debt, right? So we do have a much more international reserves than, than, than foreign debt. And that's what left us with the room of new maneuver during the pandemic to really increase our uh, debt levels without facing um, an immediate fiscal constraint or any, anything like that. That's very different from Argentina and other countries in the Southern Hemisphere who, who are really facing an external balance of payments constraints and problems of foreign debt, etc. But of course, that's, uh, that doesn't mean uh, that we are not subject to external shocks that we're not subject to currency devaluation shocks, that we do, we, we do have a problem in terms of autonomous monetary policy. We don't have uh, room many times to um, implement our domestic uh, monetary policy in a, in a way that is not associated with financial global financial cycles. So the, the agenda, of course, has to add uh, elements that are harder to deal with in terms of how, I mean, for instance, uh, are we in favor of capital controls, of doing, regulating financial flows, of trying to gain autonomy? So this is part of an agenda in a developing country and it's not necessarily present in, in, in the current progressive debates around the world. But then I'm not sure this actually, I mean, the, the political challenges are much bigger than this. I mean, having an agenda that could be called, I mean, what I'm saying here, I mean, someone could say this is a populist agenda. Um, and, and I don't see a problem with that. I mean, I don't like using the term 
but um, yes, it's an agenda that aims at delivering results, concrete results for the population. But the problem is this, uh, somehow, um, this agenda is out there. People are, in the previous elections, there were at least two or three candidates with different plans. One of them I, I, I wrote, and, and they were basically doing these things and still um, they weren't able to, to conquer um, the population for this. And, I'm, and there I'm really not sure uh, why we are such in a bad shape. I mean, I do have a clue. There is this, I mean, the, the big economic, the deep economic crisis in Brazil in 2015 and 16 uh, has been associated by, by the population to the corruption scandals that were happening more or less at the same time, even though, of course, the corruption scandals weren't big enough to create an economic recession. The economic recession had other factors behind it, including external factors and mistakes in economic policy. But the fact that corruption scandals were happening together with it, I think helped create an environment in which the state is seen as the source of the problems. It's basically, it's government spending and the state itself in a way are the, the, to blame in terms of both the economic crisis that people were facing before the pandemic even arrived. And this is something I have mentioned. I mean, already we're speaking of a lost decade in terms of income per capita. And now we may be speaking of two lost decades in terms of income per capita in Brazil. And, and this, this came after progressive governments and it came with, with, together with corruption scandals. And so in Brazil, it wasn't about blaming the immigrants say for the job losses, it was about blaming um, the, the, the political establishment and the left and the, the state in a way for, for everything that was going on. And so this corrupt state, we should get rid of it. And this is also what, help explain, what helps explain this combo between an authoritarian far right uh, approach and a, an ultra liberal uh, fund market fundamentalist um, economic policy framework in the same electoral platform. I mean, this combo, I think, has to do in Brazil with, with somehow a big frustration uh, and this, this association in the common sense that is understandable even, even though it doesn't have an economic rationale to it, it is understandable between corruption and, and, and the economic crisis. And so this is hard, to, this is a, a scenario in which when you come with an agenda and a plan that involves a bigger state and, and, and inequality reduction, fiscal policy, green recovery plans, whatever, it does not have an appeal. People see it as another somehow corrupt um, uh, attempt, irresponsible, corrupt, and whatever left-wing uh, plan, and this is really not supported by, by the majority of the population, I think, at the moment. Thank you, Laura. This brings us to the last question by Roland Montenegro. Um, hello, Laura. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was quite enlightening. And my, my question is uh, quite straightforward. Um, I mean, knowing that the auxiliary emergency always started in June, and after July, we saw the number of active cases in Brazil stabilizing. Uh, do you think it is possible to, to make a correlation between those two things? I mean, between starting the auxiliary emergency hour and seeing the, the case stabilizing, or is it too early for such an affirmation? Okay. Um, well, uh, the, I think the auxiliary emergency hour was approved in April and it started in May. But, but yes, I, 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 see, I see your question. Um, uh, I mean, it could be, it could be a possibility. That's an interesting, that's an interesting suggestion. Uh, I don't think we can say that. Uh, we, we, we should probably have an econometric type of exercise to, 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 to answer that question. And that's one of the econometric exercises that can be done, I think. Um, that's, yeah, that, I would say that's an interesting possibility, but, but I don't think we can, we can say much. I mean, I, I have to say, I doubt it. Um, it is, 
theoretically possible that really the auxilio managed to keep people at home. But when we look at the data of people going out of their homes, et cetera, satellite data, data from cell phone providers that were open to the people, et cetera, um, we see that in fact, uh, you started to loosen the, the restrictions over time. Uh, we did not see, say, uh, 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 after the auxilio emergencial, more people were at home or, or things like that that could help explain this, this link. So one, one, should, one should probably um, try to, to test this in a, in a sensible way. And, and I, I think there's, I mean, there's new data that will show up to that, that, that I think can be used as well. But that's, that's a possibility. Another possibility, as I said, is the fact that more than, I mean, there are already tests that, that have shown that more than 40% of the population in certain areas had COVID-19, uh, were exposed to the virus already. And then, of course, there is a big controversy among epidemiologists and so on. on, on I'm not talking here about immunity necessarily, but uh, uh, what is the rate of how, what's the proportion of the population that starts reducing infection rates, which is different than, than herd immunity. Maybe you do need a lot more for herd immunity, but maybe after 40% of the population caught the virus, each person is not able to contamine two people. Maybe they only infect another person. And that's already enough to, to, to maybe reverse that, that correlation chart there that I showed. So, this is another possibility. Thank you so much, Laura, for joining us today. I think this really gave us a deep um, insight into what's going on in Brazil. And I think that, as you have pointed out, a lot of parallels, but also differences with the US. Um, thank you so much for taking out the time. Um, I would also like to thank Pedro and Deva Manu, who are the student volunteers who have been relentlessly supporting this um, workshop and helping to make it public and available to all of you. So, and I would like to, of course, also thank all of you who have um, joined us today um, and uh, let you know that a recording of this meeting will be uploaded on our YouTube channel and that our next PE workshop will take place on the 27th of October, again at 4 p.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time. And it will be with Nancy Falber here from UMass Amherst and Joshi Tsikata from the University of Ghana on COVID-19 implications for the care sector from the perspective of um, Ghana and from the perspective of the United States. So if you're interested in that, please um, click the link that I've posted in the chat box and I hope to see you all again. Thank you so much, Laura, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bella. It was great um, being with you and I uh, hope we, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this um, live uh, really live uh, soon enough. I hope to visit you guys. Yes, we hope to welcome you here for real, <laughs> not only on the screen. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you, Laura.